Civil mechanical added flavor from electronics. We work in unison for the success of any development happening in the ocean environment. We are the technical arm for the Ministry of Shipping for all port related activities. Hello, hello. Another major program at present what we are carrying out is climate change impacts on coastal infrastructure and its adaptation strategies. We would be very happy to deliver a design guidelines for climate change influence on the coast. The global workforce has always seen a significant presence of Indian students and scholarship. This reflects the rich and robust Indian education system, which is deeply rooted in value-based, diverse and inclusive ethos, while being truly global in vision in its cutting-edge research, innovation and entrepreneurship. Destination South India is a step taken by IIT Madras, together with the U.S. Consulate Chennai, in partnership with U.S. IAF, Forum on Education Abroad and U.S. Study Abroad, to build a program to engage and enable academic institutions and NGOs to welcome foreign, especially U.S. students, in the Indian educational ecosystem. This is an effort that will go towards uh, uh, the idea of uh, national education policy, where we are hoping to increase the diversity in our campuses. In this workshop, we want to help Indian institutions prepare to host U.S. students and to partner with U.S. universities. We also want to help American students understand that South India offers a fantastic academic and cultural experience. We've welcomed hundreds of American students to India who come to conduct research, learn about Indian culture and society, and study modern Indian languages through the Fulbright Nehru Fellowship Program. I believe there's huge potential in India for expanding study abroad and exchange programs. To facilitate this, we need to bring about a better understanding between U.S. and Indian institutions of higher education on how to design and deliver study abroad programs. We're a membership association that provides training and resources to education abroad professionals around the world. I'm looking forward to working with workshop participants to build capacity in India to host students from U.S. universities on education abroad programs. Register today to be a part of this collaboration and conversation. The Institute of Eminent Scheme has been launched by the Government of India to empower higher educational institutions and help them become world-class teaching and research institutions. IIT Madras is proud to have been selected as one of the select institutes of excellence. As part of our commitment to the cause of fostering world-class research, IIT Madras has set up a number of research initiatives in diverse fields of contemporary relevance. Many of these initiatives will go on to become centers of excellence within the IIT Madras system. A total of 68 research initiatives belonging to 21 identified technology clusters are presently underway. As part of these initiatives, it is proposed to host a series of webinars from each cluster to showcase the innovative research being generated to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists and policy makers. These webinars will give an opportunity to engage in conversation with eminent faculty from IIT Madras and other international researchers and also to find more collaboration in those research areas. So why wait? Click the link below to be a part of this. The greenery, the people around, the facilities that we have, it is one of the best places to live in Chennai. <laughs> Another added advantage of being inside the campus. Campus has uh, two schools, one is CBSE based and the other one is the state board. It's a pleasant um, experience for the kids as well because um, they don't have to worry about going in search of any facilities, everything is available on campus. We have a shopping center in the residential Hello and good.
good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Lisa from the Office of Global Engagement, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 66th webinar from the IRIS webinar series. The Institute of Eminence Scheme was launched by the Government of India to empower higher education institutions and help them to become world-class teaching and research institutes. IIT Madras is proud to have been selected as one such Institute of Eminence. A total of 68 research initiatives belonging to 21 identified technological clusters are presently underway at IIT Madras. As part of these initiatives, the IRIS webinar series aimed to showcase the innovative research being generated to various stakeholders like students, researchers, industrialists, and policymakers. From the microelectronics and integrated circuit cluster, the research initiative presented today is titled RF Analog and Mixed Signal Integrated Circuits, which is led by Professor Shanti Pavan and Professor Narendra Krishnapura. Professor Shanti Pavan obtained his data from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and PhD from Columbia University, New York. He has worked as an analog design engineer at Texas Instruments, Fairchild Semiconductors, and analog device in the USA and Canada. He is currently Alexander Chair Professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. His interests are analog and mixed signal design and analog signal processing. He is an IEEE Fellow and a Fellow of Indian National Academy. Today, the speaker is Professor Nagendra Krishnapura. He obtained his B.Tech from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and PhD from Columbia University, New York. He has worked as an analog designer in Celeb, in Multilink, and with his semiconductor in the ESA. He has taught analog circuit design courses at Columbia University, New York, USA, as an adjunct faculty. He is currently a professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Midwest. His interests are analog and Arab circuit design and analog signal processing. Professor Mike Chen has joined as a moderator today, and he is currently a professor at the Electronic Engineering Department, USC, and holds Colleen and Roberto Padovani early, chair, early career chair position. He received his B.S. degree from National Taiwan University in 1998 and the M.S. and Ph.D. degree from University of California, Berkeley in 2002 and 2006, all in electrical engineering. As a graduate student researcher, he proposed and demonstrated the first asynchronous SAR ADC architecture, which has been adapted today for low-power, high-speed, analog to digital conversion products in the industry. Dr. Chen was the recipient of Qualcomm Faculty Award in 2019, NSF Faculty Early Career Development Award, and DRPA Young Faculty Award both in 2014. He has also achieved a honorable mention in the Asian Pacific Mathematics Olympiad in 1994, UC Regents Fellowship at Berkeley in 2000, and Analog Devices Outstanding Student Award for Recognition IC Design in 2006. Dr. Chen has been serving as an associate editor for IEEE Solid State Circuit Letters, IEEE Transaction on Circuits and Systems to Express Briefs, as well as TPC member of conferences in IEEE Solid State Circuit Society, such as IEEE International Solid State Circuit Conferences, IEEE VLSI Circuit Symposium, and IEEE Custom Integrated Circuit Conference. He is currently serving as a distinguished lecturer in IEEE Solid State Circuits today. Uh, Dr. Janik Raman from Ele Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Madras, and Dr. Sauro Saxena from Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Madras, has also joined as a panelist today. It's my pleasure to welcome you all. Before we start, a note to the participants. Kindly enter your question and answers, questions in the Q&A box so that the moderator can Prioritize it. I welcome it's it's over to you, Professor Nagel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. It's a, a pleasure to uh, give a webinar about uh, our work. So this is the work of uh, our uh, Center for Excellence. Let me share the slides and uh, give you a glimpse of uh, what we have done and uh, the direction in which we want to go and the motivation for the same. Yeah. 
So there are four of us uh, who are introduced, the Shanti Pawan, Saurabh Saxena, Janak Raman, and myself, uh, who are uh, the faculty working under, uh, working for the Center of Excellence in RF and Log Index Signal Integrated Circuits. Shanti Pawan, uh, Janki Raman, uh, Shanti Pawan works on uh, analog circuits, uh, mainly ADCs and DACs, and also precision analog and mixed signal circuits. Janki Raman works on uh, uh, neural networks, uh, hardware accelerator for neural networks in memory computing and so on. Uh, Saurabh works on high-speed serial links, uh, phase lock loops, uh, frequency synthesizers, and I work on analog and mixed signal circuits, RF circuits, and also frequency synthesizers. Now, uh, this uh, slide gives a, a brief motivation uh, for our work. Today, I think all of you are aware that uh, computing and communication are everywhere. Here, uh, a few examples are shown from very large systems like the supercomputer and the data center to uh, handheld devices, laptops, and so on. Uh, the, what is common to all this is the com computation and communication is at the heart of all these things. Now, while computation and communications are common themes, the constraints may be uh, somewhat different in each case. So in portable devices, especially in handheld devices, the emphasis is on low power. And when you do have computation, it's uh, uh, spending as little energy uh, in each computation. And also for communication, it's to spend as little energy in communicating each bit. Now, low power is also important for the supercomputers and data centers and so on. But of course, they are not running on batteries. So there, the emphasis is on very high performance and very high speed data transmission. Some of you who are related to the area know that uh, transmission on wires have exceeded 100 gigabits per second recently and pro probably will exceed 200 gigabits per second also. So now, uh, where does our work fit in? We are, of course, not making these gadgets or data centers and so on. So our expertise falls uh, in the key building blocks of uh, these types of devices. And each of us has uh, uh, taken it upon ourselves to uh, improve the state of the art of these devices. So this uh, shows a block diagrammatically a link between communication and computing. And within communication, you know that uh, we have uh, wireless communication, which uh, could be in the form of uh, cellular communication or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. All of you probably have this, and many of you have connected to this seminar using this. Similarly, there is what is known as wireline communication. Which uh, in which you communicate through links, broadband channels, which could be Ethernet, USB, and I said wires, but this also includes optical links, which are used for very high speed communication. And within computing, you have the conventional DSP as well as machine learning, which is uh, up and coming and is expected to play a very, very important role in the future. Now, while these all these things look different, I will show block diagrams of uh, wireless and wireline communications and show that there are a number of uh, common blocks, especially analog blocks. And interestingly, uh, machine learning, while it looks like uh, uh, something digital is being done because I put it under the communications block, has a number of uh, analog computation, uh, uh, has a number of uh, 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 features in it, which makes analog computation an attractive option. So Professor Janke Roman is working on this. Basically, he's working on optimized in-memory computing using uh, uh, memory cells. Basically, yeah. So what happens in a memory is uh, shown here. This is the conventional memory. Now, this in-memory computing is especially suited for uh, machine learning. And as I mentioned, in handheld devices, uh, it is most important to use as little energy in computation as possible. That is, uh, I'll give a very, very uh, brief overview of this. The way the computation is done in this uh, memory is by uh, driving different voltages on the word lines as shown here. And then when you uh, combine all of them on the bit line, some voltage is formed, which is a linear combination of the voltages that you drive. That linear combination, that is the computation. You have to sense that voltage, and that is done using A to D converters. And you, now you can see you have a large number of these uh, A to D converters here. Now, these numbers can be in thousands or even more, right? So it turns out that if you try to make very precise A to D converters in each of these places, either the power consumption or the area or both will become exceedingly large. 
So what Professor Janki Raman is working on is a way of reducing the size and complexity of this part while computing in the same way as possible. So the idea that is being exploited is that uh, what is being computed, uh, the thing that on which you do the computation is some image data. Now, once the image is given, it turns out that these voltages span a very small range. So what uh, he has proposed is to use a single ADC that has a very high precision to find out which range the values are in, and then use very crude ADCs and a smaller number of them around that range. This is something like uh, if you, let's say you didn't know uh, where the voltage lay, then you had to search all the way from, uh, all the way over the entire range of the uh, voltages that are possible. But if you know that, let's say voltages are always between, uh, voltages are between uh, 500 and 600 millivolts, then you have to only search over that small range. So that's the idea is exploiting to make this uh, entire, uh, reduce the complexity of that. And he is uh, working on that. Some of the early work has been uh, reported in this paper and also has been patented. So this is the prototype chip. So the one feature of our work is that we uh, demonstrate our work on uh, prototype chips and that's what makes the work very interesting as well as challenging. Now, so I showed uh, wireless and uh, wireline communication blocks. This shows, for instance, a wireless communication transmitter on the top and receiver on the bottom. You don't have to worry too much about the details of this, but those of you who are familiar with radios know that at the antenna, you have signals around a high frequency. It is, uh, uh, whereas inside, uh, it is converted to low frequency signals by mixing or in the transmitter, the low frequency is converted to high frequency by mixing. And after that, in the receiver, you have a filter and eventually you will have an analog to digital converter so that you can do the digital signal processing and storage. Similarly, on the transmitter side, you start from digital signals and uh, convert that to analog and transmit it. Now, you can uh, see that uh, there are many common blocks between this and what I'm going to show next, which uh, is for wireline communications. Notice that you have an ADC here and a DAC and a frequency synthesizer and a filter and so on. So in a serial link, similarly, you have a transmitter. In this case, it doesn't go into an antenna, but goes to some wire and you have the receiver. Here also, you can see ADCs in DACs. You also have a frequency synthesizer to generate clocks. They are called carriers in a radio and then clocks in a uh, serial link. Okay, and it performs some signal processing. Okay. So one of the very crucial building blocks of any modern system is an analog to digital converter. This is true even, even in so-called purely digital systems. You have ADC, ADCs used for a number of different functions. Professor Shanti Pawan uh, works, on, works in this area, uh, in the area of high-performance ADCs. He has uh, published a number of uh, papers uh, detailing uh, many techniques for high-performance ADCs. So the ADCs are here. And his work refers to ADCs that can be used for industrial and scientific applications, in which case you need very, very high signal to noise and distortion ratio. This is like resolving a voltage to 18 bits or 20 bits or something of the sort. Now, one of the difficulties is many of the ADCs are based on uh, switch capacitor circuits in which at the input you have a capacitor which is charged abruptly to some voltage. Now, anyone who has taken a basic electrical circuits course knows when you change the voltage on a capacitor abruptly, it draws an instantaneous uh, charge packet, which constitutes an infinite amount of current. So this uh, makes it very difficult to drive, the, uh, very difficult to design the circuit that is preceding the ADC. Okay, whatever is preceding the ADC has to be very complicated, has to be able to drive a very large amount of current in a very short time. So what he has proposed and what is a recent trend is to have resistors at the input of ADCs instead of uh, capacitors. So the resistive input impedance uh, is greatly advantageous. You can see just from the size of what is coming in front of the ADC in addition to the ADC, it is a lot simpler on the right side than the left side. And it turns out also, any, as uh, I think your first encounter with sampling, you know about aliasing. So anytime you sample, you also have the anti-alias. This type of ADC also has the implicit anti-aliasing property, which makes it very advantageous, okay? So 
he has demonstrated uh, uh, this is an example of an adc demonstrated by him and his students so in this case i'll only highlight this uh, spectrum to show that this is the fundamental and the second harmonic and third harmonic are well below 100 db below the fundamental okay so this constitutes a very very high precision okay so this means that if uh, basically uh, if the the fundamental is 1 volt in amplitude the harmonics are uh, of the order of 10 microvolts or so or even less than that okay maybe 3 microvolts or something of the sort so this uh, level of high precision adcs needs very meticulous design which has been done uh, and you can see the uh, chip photograph on the right side and you can also see that it performs this uh, graph shows uh, uh, performance metrics if you are on the top left of this graph it means it is highest uh, performing so you can see that basically uh, the noise spectral density of this uh, uh, adc is much lower than other published work and another up and coming uh, technique uh, is this high speed pipeline adcs this can be used in uh, uh, very wide band radios multi channel radios uh, to basically convert a very wide bandwidth of uh, analog signals to digital so here again uh, the continuous time delta sigma adc advantage is also apply the input is resistive and uh, uh, that gives you an advantage in power dissipation as well as in resolution okay so it is easier to drive uh, it's a lot easier to make than uh, circuits that use switch capacitor now another common block is this frequency synthesizer they generate carriers in radios or clocks in uh, uh, serial links they are also used even with adcs to generate clocks these clock generators are very common again as i said this is one of the blocks that is there in purely digital circuit if you take a processor or a memory which you would think of as a purely digital ic it will have a frequency synthesizer Professor uh, Saurabh Saxena is a specialist in this area and he works on this. And one of the uh, things he is working on is uh, to have a precise uh, frequency, the clocks, uh, the way you generate clocks is by taking quartz crystal oscillators. Quartz crystal oscillators have a very precise frequency which does not change significantly with temperature. It is related to material properties of quartz. But they operate at a low frequency. So for them to be used in uh, modern high speed systems, they have to be multiplied up to a very high frequency. So one of the recent things he has proposed is a two stage uh, clock multiplier that uh, uh, can be varied over a wide range, whose output frequency can be varied over a wide range, which is compact because it does not use any uh, on chip inductors and so on, and has a very uh, well behaved spectrum, meaning the spectrum of an ideal periodic uh, source should be an impulse. Usually you see noise and other impulses in addition. The smaller they are, the better it is. And this, for instance, shows that uh, the spurious tones are uh, uh, substantially below the fundamental frequency. It basically represents a clean spectrum, which uh, means that it is close to being periodic. So this graph shows some metrics, which uh, you need some more technical knowledge to appreciate. It basically uh, shows how the circuit behaves across different output frequencies. Now, one of the other things that uh, we work on, in this case, this is my work, is on widely tunable active delay lines. Now, this is uh, related to uh, how antennas are configured in modern systems. You have multiple antennas, and you combine the signals from multiple antennas. Now, the only issue is the wave can be coming in from any direction. So the waves hitting the different antennas arrive at different times. So you have to compensate them by inserting delay lines in each of these paths. If you have a very large antenna array, you can imagine that you need a very large delay and also a widely tunable delay. Because if the beam comes in from another direction to steer it, you will need a large delay on this one and no delay on that. So what uh, I and my students have come up with is a technique uh, for broadband delay lines using active elements. And it is related to, I think all of you again from the basics know that a transmission line generates a delay. We have a way of making a synthetic active transmission line whose length can be adjusted. Of course, we don't go and cut the transmission line physically, but electronically it is effectively cut by doing some switching. And uh, consequently, we can uh, control the delay of the transmission line. 
So this uh, shows a demonstration where the delay has been varied and you can see that the input pulse shown in black is delayed by various amounts, okay? So that gives you a glimpse of uh, uh, our work. I think uh, for some reason the slides are jumping. I just give me a moment. I'll exit the full screen mode for a moment. So that gives you a glim uh, glimpse into our group's work. Our group has uh, more than uh, 50 research students and it is the by far the leading academic group uh, in India working in analog mix signal IC design. And we regularly uh, fabricate uh, chips and uh, measure them and publish their results. We have measured like more than 100 chips now. In fact, we have sort of stopped counting. And we are also the first academic group to uh, publish papers in uh, the leading venues in uh, Indian academia. I think I need to exit the full screen mode because the slide seems to be jumping around. And uh, this is the leading venue for dissemination of work on IC design. And if you look at this, uh, more than 80% of all the papers published in the IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits from India have been from our group. And similarly, the IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems is uh, the top venue for disseminating work on circuit theory. This is a broad journal that encompasses digital analog and other uh, kind of some uh, aspects of control, DSP and so on. Here also, we uh, you notice that we are the single largest group publishing. So this basically testifies to the strength of our group and the technical strength of our center of excellence. And we have been very active in the international uh, community. We are associate editors of uh, leading uh, journals and we are in the technical program committee of uh, various conferences. And uh, Professor Shanti Pawan has also authored a book that is the standard reference for uh, Delta Sigma ADCs, and in fact, his uh, video course is also a standard reference on this uh, subject, especially on continuous time Delta Sigma ADCs. So with that, uh, that uh, sort of, I will uh, finish the overview. If you want any more details, of course, you can uh, come to our group. In fact, it would be best if you join our group. We are situated in a spectacularly beautiful uh, uh, campus. It's very hard to get another campus like this in India or even worldwide, I would say. And uh, you can join our uh, center of excellence. There are various uh, ways in which you can participate. You, the most uh, common thing is for you to become a research student here, either for either in our master's by research program or into our PhD program. And you can be part of all this uh, work that we are doing. And we would also like all the smart students to join us so that uh, we can maintain our uh, leading position and uh, continue with our innovations in the area of uh, integrated circuits. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Krish Napura. Uh, that was an excellent uh, overview for the entire uh, excellence of centers. Uh, so before I you know, start asking questions, I just wanna say a few things. You know, I think me being in the field, uh, I can assure you that you know, they do have uh, world-class you know, researchers you know, in this department. You know? Uh, you know, you look at the work that they have produced, you know, as, uh, you know, Professor Krish Napura just point out, you know, they consistent, consistently publish in those uh, premier uh, conferences and journals, and those are the paper actually, you know, people outside the world, actually outside, outside this, uh, you know, department actually all read them, right, carefully. So, uh, so that I think speak to the quality, and I see that, you know, you're adding also new blood, you know, to the uh, to the department, to this group, and I think that's uh, really uh, exciting. So uh, I guess I think uh, the audience actually already start asking questions, and, and I think that, you know, people seem to be very excited, you know, you know with the opportunity that, that you guys provided. Uh, but let me maybe first, you know, ask a very high-level uh, questions. Um, uh, as you point out, you know, the future, you know, you know, has a lot of challenging. It's really exciting time for the electronics, right? A more speed, more bandwidth. You know, I, I was wondering, um, uh, there are certainly, you know, many, many different aspects. So let me uh, go one by one. 
So for the communication, uh, what do you think is the most you know challenging you know part? You know, obviously you guys you know really can do every component you know through the chain. Uh, what are the most you know challenging aspect that you think that we should solve you know in the next five ten years? And, and that's you know, that you know obviously will provide opportunity for this uh, potential students to join your department and uh, or collaborate you know with your department uh, to move forward. So I guess uh, I was wondering if you can please comment on you know what what are the challenging aspects you know in terms of communication in the next five ten years and that's you know <clears throat> something that you know we as a research re uh, researchers that can really uh, take on yeah uh so let me take a stab at it so as you well know uh in uh, serial links the speeds have been increasing like crazy pretty much it's now at 112 gigabits per second 224 and so on now uh, of course that is very challenging uh, one of the at the same time i mean in academic uh, groups there is also a limitation on uh, uh, what you can work on so one of the key building blocks for all such is a very low uh, jitter clock generator and uh, the jitter has been reducing down to like 100 frames per second and below that so i think uh, basically making better and better clock generators essentially to get uh, better timing reference so that you can uh, time everything more precisely that is one of the uh, challenges and of course the other uh, technical challenge comes from uh, technology that is you have to work with uh, these lower voltages it gives you high speed but uh, that itself is challenging i think others also can perhaps comment on this aspect uh, yeah so uh, i think professor narendra commented about the serial links uh, right uh, for the bandwidth, uh, what we see is that as you go uh, higher and higher data rates, uh, they are only supported by lower technology nodes. So, and we cannot, we do not have access to them uh, to work. So, what we would like to do is uh, that in the available technology node, we would like to increase the data rate and or reduce the energy consumption as low as possible. So uh, what we see is that uh, we are still uh, consuming a lot of energy in transmitting bits like four or five picojoules per bit uh, in technology like 65 or 28. Uh, so given the technology and given the data rates, uh, we try to reduce them as much as possible. So that is something which we uh, which we explore in the in our research group. Wonderful. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. Um, so, uh, so with that, you know, I guess uh, I'm gonna ask a question to Professor Pavan. You know, I know he did a lot of ADC designs. So, as you can see, there are so many different systems um, here. Um, so, what what do you think is the, the 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 future of this ADC? What was the trend of the ADC? You know, in light of all those you know communications, you know, challenges as well as you know uh, the computation, right? Even the computation, now I see the ADC there. So what, yeah. what, what, what is your view for the future of the ADC? What, what are the things that we need uh, to really pay attention to you know, in the next five, 10 years? Okay, uh, so let me see, uh, start from the uh, communication viewpoint. Uh, I let Janaki answer the, uh, com uh, the computing aspect of the uh, ADCs. Uh, so, you know, if you actually go and take a look at at uh, the uh, you know history of high speed, uh, uh, you know Nyquist type uh, uh, ADCs, uh, for a long time uh, the discrete time pipeline ADC was the uh, you know has been the workhorse, and uh, you know it's uh, maybe over the last uh, uh, decade or so, uh, you know time interleaved SARS have have uh, started uh, you know uh, coming in but uh, it seems like the 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 uh, the predominant uh, technology at this point for really high speed uh, uh, a medium to high resolution uh, a2d conversion uh, is all based on the discrete time pipeline right and uh, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, if you go back uh, over the last 50 years and uh, look at how circuit design evolved uh, first uh, you know there was a big uh, amount of uh, a large amount of interest and a lot of work in uh, switch capacitor circuits so, so when mos first started uh, uh, you know switch capacitor uh, circuits were invented 
and uh, you can see a lot of activity in switch capacitor filters. And then, you know, about in the mid 80s or so, uh, people, uh, you know, started moving to continuous time filters. Uh, and the activity in switch capacitor filters uh, simply uh, just went down. Uh, and, you know, and uh, all the filters, uh, which were the main signal processing aspects at that time, uh, all moved to continuous time. Then we fast forward uh, to the ADC space. And then, you know, in the early 90s, all the ADCs uh, were based on, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of the ADCs, especially precision ADCs, uh, were all based on uh, discrete time delta sigma techniques, right? And uh, again, fast forward another 10 years, and uh, people have pretty much forgot, had forgotten about uh, discrete time delta sigma ADCs and moved continuous time, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the only forte of, uh, of discrete time circuits at this point seems to be uh, in high speed A to D conversion seems to be the discrete time pipeline. And, uh, uh, you know, I believe that going forward in the next 10 years for, uh, for all the advantages that there are, I think the continuous time pipeline is going to replace the discrete time pipeline, uh, like how continuous time delta sigmas have uh, and continuous time filters have replaced discrete their discrete time uh, counterparts. Uh, uh, continuous time pipelines are are uh, really low power. Uh, uh, they can be extremely uh, low noise when compared to the combination of an explicit anti-alias filter and uh, a discrete time pipeline, and uh, they're uh, they're easy to drive because there's no there's no large capacitor to uh, I mean uh, to drive. Uh, of course, there are challenges, but uh, most of the challenges seem to be in the digital domain. And uh, so when you compare it with a solution having a filter, an anti-alias filter and an ADC, a continuous time pipeline is, is, uh, is uh, smaller, it's lower power, uh, uh, it's, it's easier to design. And uh, a lot of the complexity has moved from the analog domain to the digital domain, right? This is exactly where technology is going. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm personally betting a lot on uh, seeing these converters basically uh, uh, make a big impact, especially in applications like, you know, 5G and, you know, uh, and higher, where you have to build, uh, you know, arrays of, of uh, transceivers. So you have a lot of data converters on the chip and, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting things where, which are discrete time in nature, Basically, uh, you know, uh, at high speeds, basically means you have to time interleave, uh, which adds a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of hassle, right? Whereas uh, these appear to be uh, a way of of avoiding all that participation on the input buffer and and the reference, and uh, 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 and you know, basically combining anti-alias filtering with uh, data conversion. So. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I'm very bullish, as you can see, on uh, on uh, continuous time uh, pipeline ADCs. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's certainly an exciting you know direction that you know, and and, and I think fortunately, you know, you you are really a pioneer, you know, in, in that field. So I'm sure that you know a more you know exciting work will coming from from uh, from your team. Thank um, you. So I, yeah. So I guess the next. Uh, uh, we're going to move a little bit to the computing side, right? So, uh, Professor uh, Vera Rockman, uh, obviously, you know, is a new blood, I guess, you know, to the centers uh, on this computing side. Uh, so, a couple of questions here, you know, A, you know, regarding the ADC, what, what do you think is the challenging of those mixing or ADC and DAC in this uh, realm of uh, yeah. computing? So. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so this is a very exciting time to be working in this area. Uh, I mean, it's uh, sort of, I would say, uh, very similar to, you know, how adders, you know, the circuit design aspect of adders were a couple of decades back, right? Because people are now trying to find uh, some circuit techniques to make things faster. And uh, in that, I would think, uh, you know, uh, it's ultimately the number of tops right? The tera operations per second, the tops per watt, uh, how, how many operations you can do per watt and, uh, you know, how many tops per mm square that really matter, right? And in this respect, uh, it, it just obviously means that you need to be able to do as much parallel computing as possible, right? 
So you have to minimize uh, serial operations and which means the biggest challenge in an ADC will not be in terms of high frequency or anything like that, but it will be in terms of squeezing them down to the uh, bit line pitch in a memory. Right, uh, and if we can uh, get them to you know squeeze very nicely and optimize uh, uh, parallel computation there in a very area constrained manner, I think uh, that would be a great winner. People have already made uh, you know a, a big advancement in the last one year or so in just in this area, right? <clears throat> and another area which is probably uh, I think just like adders, you know, where uh, the circuit design aspects stop stop giving enough uh, benefit, people started looking at the architecture of adders, you know, the carry look ahead and stuff. I think like that, it, what will now matter is how can you combine these, uh, you know, sub arrays that can do in-memory computing in the analog domain uh, and combine them digitally to, to actually do larger computations because the uh, deep neural networks are becoming wider and wider, right? Not just deeper. They are also becoming very wide, which means that you need more sub arrays to compute and combine these results, uh, all of them together, right? So I think that will be, uh, uh, you know, how optimally you can do that is, is, an, is an open question. And uh, I think the third most interesting part is, uh, you know, also the area of neural networks itself. Deep learning is evolving so much, right? And people uh, really, uh, you know, even the computer science people don't know why things work that way, right? I think as answers emerge, we'll find that, uh, you know, already we find that they are very error tolerant, right? So I think the, if we can uh, incorporate all these non-idealities from hardware, right? With minimum calibration and measurement into our training, I think that also would be a very uh, exciting area. I mean, all these areas people are looking at already, but I think uh, these will primarily determine, uh, you know, where, the uh, field of computing and in-memory computing in particular heads. Thank you. Thank you for a nice uh, you know, overview on, on, the, on the challenges and you know, the, 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 the trend. Uh, so I think uh, earlier I also saw a question from the audience. You know, um, basically, you know, in the computing right now, especially you, know, you have uh, you know, experience on both sides. You have VOSI uh, digital approach, and you also have this analog sort of mixing node approach. You know how how do we actually strike a balance? You know what 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 when when should we do actually do those computing in the you know just you know for example you know designing a better adders right in the digital or you know should I just you know go for mixing no and then just design a very good ADC and DAC you know to handle those so yeah. so how how should we do this uh, balance uh, or map? I, I, yeah I think that's a great uh, question and uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Naresh Shanbagh's group recently published a review paper where they spoke about you know uh, what is the digital noise what is the analog noise right I think that's sort of still uh, not very well answered in terms of you know uh, how much computation can you do in the analog domain and how much uh, how easily can you combine the answers digitally Right. So this is uh, something that people are looking at. If you look at, uh, you know, currently, there are people looking at uh, doing large computations using large uh, memory arrays. And there are also groups which are looking at computing using smaller arrays. And of course, if you use smaller arrays, then uh, you got to combine the answers digitally. Right. Whereas if you do it with a large array, you can do a large portion, large computation. Right. And uh, the uh, results are a uh, little mixed at this point, right? The, uh, uh, at least to me, it's not very evident uh, uh, which one is going to be the final winner. And, uh, but people are exploring and it, it's nice to see that some groups have published, uh, you know, up to over one tera operations per second and, you know, great results with large sub arrays as well. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I know this is a tough question, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see more, you know, exciting, you know, work and, you know, analysis from your group also, you know, in the future. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so next, uh, I have a general question, I guess, for everyone. Uh, I think, you know, in the beginning, I know that uh, Professor Krishna Nupura showed us a slide, right, showing us communication, uh, computing, and uh, DSP and machine learning, right? So this AI machine learning seems to be one of the hot topic, you know, not just in computer science these days, but also in double E, right? Uh, so, and since like you have excellent, you know, people here in analog RF mixing node design. So I wonder if you can comment on 
what can be the potential impact of this AI machine learning on the design aspect, right? So, so to make it clear, this is not to build this AI machine learning you know, accelerator. Uh, this is for how can we potentially use AI machine learning to help on the design itself? Like, you know, when you design DC or design the, the, the front end, do, do you see any um, opportunity there or, or you could feel any impact, you know, on those uh, uh, design, from the design aspect? Uh, yeah, so uh, do I take that question? Uh, any of you, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure, I think sure. this will affect, uh, uh, affect every, every one of you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, my answer I had already uh, summarized, right? In terms of, uh, so if I understand the question, it's 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 about the impact on design, is it? Uh, can yes, you... the, the circuit design. So the, when you design the PLO, design the ADC, design the filter, right? Design, uh, yeah, a lot of exciting projects that you guys have uh, in the department. Do you think that, you know, there's anything that it can help? Like, you know, for example, I think uh, uh, Professor Pavan mentioned about calibration, right? Uh, I wonder if there is uh, some opportunity there, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah, so uh, my answer I had already summarized uh, earlier, right, in terms of uh, what happens in memory. So maybe I'll just let uh, Professor Shanti Pawan uh, give his opinion here. Yeah, I mean, I, I thank you, Janaki. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities for uh, for uh, ML2 uh, in calibration of ADCs, uh, especially, you know, AD, I mean, uh, a lot of sources of nonlinearity and mismatch and so on are unknown, right? So you basically want some generic building block which basically fixes all those problems. So it seems very likely that you know some machine learning engine uh, uh, can be trained to uh, to fix uh, 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 fix you know uh, linearity problems or uh, mismatch problems in an uh, ADC, uh, especially in a production environment. You have very have tons of data. Right and uh, and you can train, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, I still think that uh, you know uh, a more careful approach to uh, root causing these problems uh, and fixing them will probably be a lower power approach. Uh, but uh, but you know just dumping a neural network and fixing the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 issues with linearity and and uh, uh, I mean, mismatch and so on. Uh, maybe it may become a generic uh, engine, calibration engine, which can be thrown in with uh, with uh, with any ADC, and uh, uh, perhaps the uh, the ML algorithm can learn uh, non linearities and 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 uh, you know uh, uh, interleaving artifacts and and figure out what to do to fix it. So, uh, I mean, that's the uh, what I would think would be some kind of holy grail. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in the calibration space. Uh, but uh, do you have any uh, any opinion? Yeah, I I agree with you. I think I think uh, you know, in a way, you know, if you think about all this calibration, you know, it's actually in nature. It is a uh, machine learning, right? Yeah. <laughs> let this chip to learn what are the non reality and how to you know compensate for that, right? So so I guess you know it's just a matter of you know how you know. How much you know designer need to step in to identify those sources, or we just blindly let those algorithm to uh, to take uh, take over? So the answer probably will be somewhere in between. Yeah, you know? I, <laughs> I think yeah. people are trying to find the balance between the two. Yep. Uh, so very exciting, and I'm sure that you know, uh, uh, you also have a lot of things to come in. I know he also do a lot of RF high frequency. Uh, but before uh, you answer that question, uh, I do see a, a comment in the audience. Uh, they were wondering, you know, whether there's a millimeter wave IC activity in in your center, and I think that's uh, probably important to address that question. Yeah. Uh, so the answer to that is uh, yes. There was a five G related project, and we have made uh, some millimeter wave ICs. And some of our colleagues outside the one of our colleagues outside this uh, center is also uh, working on that. Yeah, so for instance, one of the work, I did not mention that in detail, but uh, one of my students worked on a very high speed, uh, uh, very high frequency uh, oscillator and a frequency synthesizer for millimeter wave radios. It was in the 28 gigahertz band. And uh, again, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, so I'm kind of continuing work on that. 
So yeah, there is some uh, millimeter wave activity uh, going on yeah, at IID Madras. So just to go back to this uh, business of ML and uh, circuit design. So of course, ML itself could be used for uh, circuit design. Earlier, I guess the, the comments were related to how ML can be used to fix the imperfections in circuits. Now, this also, I feel that maybe uh, what will end up happening is that uh, some of the circuit design tools will get better. It won't be the one extreme where uh, you just press a button and this ML engine goes and designs a circuit for you. But maybe the amount of manual intervention that you have to do will become smaller uh, because uh, maybe uh, the tools will get better, just like for digital, where uh, initially everything was done by hand and now a lot of the stuff is automated. Maybe more of the analog stuff also will get automated or maybe you will get uh, uh, at least to see a glimpse of, uh, uh, I mean, basically explore many alternatives more quickly than if you did everything manually because uh, let's say you have two or three different alternatives in mind. Maybe it's easy to simulate, but of course, it's a, if it, uh, all of that is layout sensitive, it becomes too laborious to do the layout for each one of those alternatives and then see how it works. Maybe some of those things can get uh, quicker or better with this uh, ML. Maybe you get, a, uh, you get to know beforehand which one is uh, uh, better, or maybe uh, sometimes, I mean, I see some papers at least reporting somewhat uh, counterintuitive or some quicker optimization than what a human being could do. But yeah, there is uh, still time to, I mean, we need time to tell because we don't know how much effort went in before training the uh, ML engine, right? So uh, that part is not clear. But especially things like uh, optimizing EM structures, inductor structures and so on, maybe there it'll come in more uh, quickly because right now people try out different structures and see which works best, but maybe with this, uh, this can go and explore a whole bunch, I mean, a lot more alternatives than what a human being has the patience for. Right. Yeah, that's uh, exciting. It's still a lot of uh, challenges to, to be designed, especially for the high frequency uh, circuit. Um, so I guess uh, judging from the question from the audience, I think already a lot of people seems to, you know, really enthusiastic about your department, your centers, you know, really want to, you know, uh, join you guys. Um, so, so I think some of the audience actually earlier, I saw some question, they, they saw that you guys all present this, you know, very complicated uh, analog RF mixing those circuits, right? And they were wondering from education perspective, you know, how do they actually eventually get there? You know, what, what, what does the center offer to help them, to guide them, you know, ev eventually, you know, reach to this elite level as, as what you guys are showing? Yeah, uh, I think I answered it. And in fact, one of our alumni also has uh, answered that. So especially for beginners, we, uh, put all our uh, lectures online. They are freely accessible to anyone. And a large number of people in India and outside uh, use them. And these lectures include uh, very uh, basic courses as well. Uh, so if you let me maybe uh, share the screen for a brief moment. So if you, I guess, are you able to see the shared screen showing video lectures? So if you go here, there are a number of uh, basic courses which you can start taking on your own. And uh, some of them, the entire course content is online. And I think that's the way to build up your basics. Uh, just curious, you know, do you guys also offer like internship opportunity, you know, to have an intern in your lab, you know, to uh, get the opportunity to help on, you know, various aspects of your project, the tape out, you know, testing and things like that. Uh, yes, we do. Actually, IIT Madras has a summer fellowship program for uh, third year undergraduates. They can come here and do the internship. And sometimes some internships may be possible outside this also. Unfortunately, last year uh, and this year, because of the pandemic, uh, that we had to suspend the summer internship program, but I think it will resume next year. Now, given the short duration of the internship, there is a limitation on the kind of uh, work that you can do. Uh, Designing an IC in three months, that is very difficult. Usually the kind of work that you would get during the internship is maybe if some IC is already there, perhaps simulating it or making very small variations to it and exploring uh, different functionality or features. So that way you get to learn the uh, uh, learn uh, something about circuit design without having to spend a lot of time uh, designing it because that does take a lot of time. Uh, 
so that could be one and occasionally it could also be with uh, measurements uh, that is also possible but usually it is with some uh, simulation exploration related to ic design that is very much possible so you can uh, basically look at the iit madras home page around january or so that is when the summer fellowships are announced and you can apply to them Great, great. Yeah, I, I think uh, <clears throat> really because uh, you you guys really pull, pull uh, very strong activities there in the circuit designs, and uh, as far as I can tell, you know, you really cover a wide spectrum. Uh, this is uh, you know all the spaces that you guys are you know always someone to uh, take care of those. Um, all right, so I think uh, 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 Najendra, I think earlier you talked about the Mimi the Wave IC. <clears throat> um, I think uh, some audience also curious about uh, the challenges, you know, a similar question, you know, what's challenges in the next five, 10 years, you know, in this uh, space of uh, really high frequency, you know, circuits. See, actually, millimeter wave ICs have opened up uh, opportunities for transistor level circuit design. I mean, earlier these uh, RF uh, CMOS ICs were in the, let's say, cellular band and so on. And what was happening was uh, there were circuit innovations for many years. And then after that, the systems got very, very complicated. To a point where basically only industry could uh, work on it. Maybe there is not much innovation at the circuit level, but uh, the challenge was in putting together lots of systems. You know that many chips have multiple radios uh, for different bands, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatnot. Now this millimeter wave is a very good thing for circuit designers in a way because it opened up opportunities for transistor level circuit design because uh, frequencies became high and it was not clear how whether or how we would uh, uh, make these circuits. So what I expect will happen is first the frequency will go on increasing, maybe you know, 30 gigahertz was high frequency earlier and now 150 gigahertz is high frequency. That is one thing. And uh, secondly, the circuit will become more and more complicated. And one perennial challenge which will makes it interesting uh, is uh, this business of uh, uh, maintaining the same functionality at a low power dissipation. Okay, whenever uh, some area like millimeter wave IC opens up, uh, People we can make circuits probably at 30 or 60 gigahertz, but they consume enormous amounts of power. Now, it may not always be possible for everyone or all groups to go after much higher frequency circuits, but it is very much possible to try and lower the power dissipation either for innovation in circuit design or system design. So these are uh, definitely, these opportunities will still be there. First of all, this uh, uh, low, uh, lowering the power that cuts across the domains of IC design. I think digital analog and all areas of analog, all areas of uh, digital. And everything is up for grabs, right? You can uh, innovate on the, so at the circuit level, at the system level, whatnot. Okay, so that is there. That will be there for millimeter wave ICs as well. And millimeter wave ICs, the other thing is uh, uh, making it, let's say, putting more stuff together. So at low frequencies, the ICs are very complex. I think similar complexity will be and can be brought to millimeter wave IC design. That is one thing that will happen. And one more thing, maybe a little more specific to millimeter wave ICs is this business of uh, phased arrays because the wavelengths are smaller. It is much more common to use phased arrays, integrated phased arrays with millimeter wave. Uh, so there again, the low power and low area are challenges because you have to put multiple units together to mount, make a phased array. So those are the challenges and people are actively working on these things. Well, yeah, I think I think those are really uh, those very challenges, and and that also bring the excitement uh, as a circuit designers. Um, uh, I do have a relevant uh, question for Professor Saxena because uh, I know you <clears throat> you really uh, you know pioneer in that uh, wireline uh, link. Uh, I see that the, the speed is also going very high, you know, to the frequency really close to millimeter wave. Uh, uh, do, do you do you share a similar uh, you know observation, you know? <laughs> That's what uh, Nachandra did. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's like the speed is uh, going like 800 gigabit Ethernet in uh, three nanometers, but uh, well, the power consumption will be running in uh, watts. So uh, that is uh, there. So uh, it's like uh, 60 gig, uh, 56 GBPS or 112 GBPS, all these things have been demonstrated. But the power, is, uh, power consumption is quite high. And uh, uh, we, uh, if, uh, as the channel loss increases, the power consumption increases further. So the idea is to uh, innovate at some design level and circuit level to reduce this power consumption uh, at uh, like 56 or 28 GPS itself. 
the other uh, which we uh, are also looking for is uh, like to double the data rate and use full duplex at these data rates so that we can increase the IO bandwidth per pin. That is uh, something which is also uh, being looked at. So we do not need to go for that high rate uh, if we can uh, increase the IO bandwidth per pin. But, uh, yes, this power consumption is a huge challenge uh, as we go for higher and higher uh, data rates. Uh, and given the technology limitation, uh, it becomes uh, more. Cool. Yeah, so I think I should relate to that. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, can I say one thing? Sure, yeah, please. So I think uh, Professor Shantiman talked about these high-speed ADCs and DACs. Uh, so I think there is a uh, lot in looking at uh, from high-speed ADCs and DAC side uh, to increase the data rate of uh, CERDIS. So uh, uh, that is uh, another area which we uh, are looking at. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I think you know, there, there's a lot of uh, coherent activities you know, across the group here. Right. Yeah. So, the group here, right. So, yeah. Um, I, I do have a question about uh, in general uh, technologies. Okay. So, do you think that you know in all your field, uh, you know your, your area, uh, area, do you think that you know we should just continue push for in the CMOS or you know in some particular circuit design area that you know you may consider other technologies? You know, and and, and I see that you know some audience was asking like the gallium nitride. Uh, or do you think that we should still con consider like bipolar devices in, in some of those, uh, your, your, your projects, your, your designs? So I wonder if the panel can, uh, the panelist can uh, uh, comment on this. Oh, well, uh, whatever we can consider, it better be cheap. Uh, uh, <laughs> because <laughs> That's a very practical, yeah, practical. So, yeah, so uh, I don't know how it is in the US, but uh, yeah, here I think access to technology uh, uh, maybe uh, below 28 is, is probably not possible. And uh, even if it was possible, it's super expensive. So uh, most of our designs are done in 65 and we've just now Janaki and uh, Saurabh have moved to uh, 28. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it doesn't appear to be very feasible to move to technologies uh, below that uh, anytime soon. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is the experience, what is your experience been, uh, have you, uh, been able to get access to technologies like, uh, you know, better than 28? Yeah. So I think, uh, you're right. You know, that's going to be super expensive. Um, so, so, uh, here in us, you know, we would, uh, go for the government sponsors. So, so for example, you know, we have. Uh, in the past few years, we have uh, this uh, 14, 12 nanometer fin fat technologies, uh, but it was so expensive that you know, of course, I cannot pay for that. So, so the uh, the government actually need to pay the bill. So, so that will be a project specific, you know, and then we just uh, the government need need to really help out here. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I can of course I cannot imagine how I can possibly use like five nanometers. <laughs> You know, to to that, that that kind of level. So, so yeah. So that that's uh, that that will, I guess that's a common challenge. You know, uh, for all the circuit group, you know, across the world. Uh, uh, but but I, I do find that you know the, the interesting things that you know even if we use sixty five, right? I, we also like to use sixty five. Uh, that looks like a good note. But in terms of the student training, I think that's uh, uh, to me I, I feel that's sufficient. You know, to 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 learn and learn all that. You know, and I see. You know, all the students when they graduate, they go to industry. They still can design five millimeters. No, no, no problem. Sure, sure, absolutely, yeah. Very good. Um, so, uh, Najendra, I, I think I'm my fault about the time. I don't know what's the timeline for this. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, I know this probably close now. Saurabh, uh, what is the guideline? Anyway, there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat window which seem to be common. I'll just quickly answer that and maybe after that we can close, right? Yeah. It's not the, uh, I think there is no exact limit, but I think about now we can close it. Yeah, I think we can close, yeah. yeah. So there is a question on uh, uh, high frequency transceivers and power amplifiers, so whether it is CMOS or uh, other uh, uh, type of technology used. 
so basically if anywhere you any time you need significant power usually it is gas gallium arsenide or nowadays gallium nitride uh, power amplifiers that are used uh, for a couple of reasons uh, one is on cmos the quality factor of passives is poor uh, so efficiency tends to be poor so it's very difficult to deliver a lot of power also because the supply voltages are quite small whereas these other uh, processes use uh, dedicated process use higher voltage supplies so it becomes easier to deliver high power uh, and there is another uh, question on rf sampling i think uh, shanti's work directly bears on this type of stuff but yes uh, actually uh, the adc bandwidth has been increasing so a direct conversion at rf will become more and more feasible there are two things one is sampling rate and the input record noise you may still need some amplifier before the adc to keep the input record noise down but uh, yes there are things like that i don't know if shanti you want to additionally comment on this i uh, know i am fine yeah i think uh, yeah. so basically yes i think it will happen basically uh, now there are uh, uh, you can probably do sampling for gigahertz type signals there are a couple of different things one is whether it will be power efficient it may not yet be but it is feasible so graphene technologies it's still far away so it's not yet at the point where you can do uh, circuit design there are just experimental devices uh, so integrating it is a long way away then software tools for digital and analog actually you can uh, i think there are lots of things on the web you can go to our website and then see there are also some uh, links to free simulators and i think you can uh, try this link called opencircuitdesign.com uh, open circuit design uh, if you just uh, do that or do circuit design freeware you will see lots of links on the web which you can utilize to simulate circuits and lt spice is a tool that is freely available if you are looking for analog uh, type simulator adc best for uh, ultra low power iot applications again it's a very uh, generic question if its uh, resolution is moderate and so on maybe a sar adc will do otherwise uh, uh, continuous time delta sigma adc provides also very low power yeah so this uh, joining us yes you can join us with either any with uh, msc degree you can you write to us separately regarding uh, application process and so on so anyone who is interested in joining uh, i've already given the links and our group page has uh, links to our web pages as well as all our contact information in fact the pages themselves have a lot of information on uh, what programs we have and how to join them uh, please utilize that and depending on your specific uh, situation that is the degree that you have and so on we will be able to suggest something okay i think uh, thanks everyone thanks especially to uh, mike sen and of course my colleagues for uh, 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 attending this and answering all the questions so i believe we can probably close yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you uh, nagendra and uh, thank you mike thank you mike all right hey, mike, thanks a lot thanks a lot in touch with you for the the future plans future plans <laughs> yeah uh, th thank you dr nagendra uh, shall we close yeah yes we can yeah yeah thank, thank you, you panelists yeah thank you participants yeah. thanks everyone bye bye bye, bye. bye.